Praise be Jesus and Mary. Today's first reading is taken from the New Testament book of the Hebrews chapter 11, and it's known as the Bible's great chapter on faith. The word faith, which we use, has, we can call an objective. It has an objective and also a subjective meaning. Objectively speaking, as the Catechism says at 1814, faith is a theological virtue by which we believe in God and believe all that he has said and revealed to us and that the church proposes for our belief. And we believe these things because God has revealed them to us. So faith is primarily an act of the intellect, of the intelligence. It's believing in what someone tells us because that person is wiser than us or they're more trustworthy. And in the case of theological faith, we know that God is a lot wiser than we are. And since he's truth and love and goodness itself, then he is completely trustworthy. Subjectively speaking, faith is trust. It's Quote, our inner assurance of things hoped for, unquote, as Hebrews 11, verse 1 states. So faith, again, is a virtue by which we believe God intellectually, and it's also a feeling or a sense of certainty by which we entrust ourselves to him. In that sense, we can say faith is like a two-sided coin. On the one side, on the head side, faith helps me to embrace uh, what God says is true. On the other side, on the tail's side, faith helps me to live trusting that the Lord will take care of me and also make good on his promise to bless me if I remain faithful to him. Faith has to do with the past, the present, and the future. As regards the past, faith tells me that as far as my sins are concerned, what I've confessed to God in the confessional has been forgiven. If I've truly repented of my sins, it's been forgiven. And also regarding the past, the Lord tells me through his prophet, he says, do not remember the events of the past, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert, says the Lord. Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19. So the Lord tells me to entrust the past to him. And I may need to still heal from the past, but the Lord does not want me living in the past. I need to live in the present. I need to live in the present in faith with him. As regards the present and the future, Mary Healy uh, wrote a good commentary on this in her book on the letter to the Hebrews. She says that faith holds on to both future realities, so what's hoped for, and essentially for us, that's the blessing of paradise. That's where our real hope is. And also, faith holds on to present invisible realities, so things that we can't see but that are real. For example, Christ reigning in heaven, for example, the Holy Trinity living in my soul, or the protection of my holy guardian angel, things that are present but that are invisible. Those who live by faith, said Mary Healy, are so convicted or so convinced of God's truthfulness that they stake their whole lives on his promises, showing that these promises are real. So in that sense, faith makes future realities present and unseen realities visible. It's actually a very beautiful comment. Faith makes future realities present and unseen realities visible. It's quite profound if you stop and think about it. So faith is not just passive belief. Faith is active, obedient reliance on God, especially when we have difficulties. And in the 11th chapter of the letter to the Hebrews gives a bunch of examples of this, of how people acting on faith provide us with evidence of the things that are unseen, of the realities that are unseen, the spiritual realities. We can even think of people in our time, people like Mother Teresa or a century prior to her, the cure of ours, St. John Vianney, or even St. Pio of Pietrelcina. These are people who acted on faith, and at the same time, they actually were able to persuade others that God was real because they lived a true life of faith. The ironic thing, of course, is that saints like Mother Teresa and St. Pio and St. Faustina often 
these saints were walking in what's called spiritual darkness. It's what's called the dark night of the soul. So they themselves were in darkness spiritually, and yet God made them a light to others at the same time, which is interesting when you think about it. You're walking in darkness, but you're being a light to others. It's a profound thing and perhaps fruit for another reflection. So someone who lives by faith makes God present and real to the world here and now. Even though they can't see God, others can't see God, they can see you, they can see me, they can see us, and they need to see us as people who live by faith. My righteous one shall live by faith, says the Lord, but if he shrinks back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Hebrews 10, verse 38. As a side note, this is one of the reasons why we religious wear habits. Religious habits are signs of faith. They're signs of our consecration to God, so they're a sign to us, and they're also a sign to others of the present invisible realities of God, of His grace, of the spiritual life, of eternity, etc. Uh, and the religious habit, again, is also a, a sign of the life to come. It's a witness to future realities, what the church calls an eschatological sign. So it's a, a witness of the a sign of the last things that are to come. Even wearing the brown scapular or the miraculous medal or even wearing a crucifix, these are all signs of faith by which we witness or testify to the unseen spiritual realities. And we remember that that Greek word for witness is what? It's martus which is where we get the word martyr from, right? So we living in faith are witnesses or martyrs for Christ. The example of faith that we read about in today's first reading is the example of the patriarch Abraham. Hebrews 11 verse 8 says this, quote, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was to go, says the writer to the Hebrews. That reminded me when I read that, it reminded me of a story of a man who was climbing the Dolomite Mountains in northern Italy, and he was nearing one of the peaks of the mountains, and he looked down the valley below, and all of a sudden he slipped, and he fell, and he grabbed hold of a piece of rock, and as he was falling, and he was just dangling there over the valley, about a thousand feet or so below, and so he looked back up to the ledge where he fell and he cried out, he asked for help. He said, help someone, is there anyone there, help me. He heard a voice from heaven, he said, the voice said, I will help you. And the man said, well, who are you? And he heard the voice respond, I am the Lord, I will protect you. And he cried out, oh Lord, save me. And the man uh, was excited and the Lord said to him, he said, I will save you, let go of the rock and I will catch you, I will catch you. And then the man looked down to the valley below and he looked back up and he said, is there anyone else up there? Is there anyone else up there? Uh, the blind faith of that man, uh, which wasn't strong enough, it reminded me of the strong faith of Abraham in the, in the scriptures today, the blind faith of Abraham himself. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he was to receive as an inheritance and he went out not knowing where he was to go. It's a very powerful verse when you think about it. God tells Abraham to leave his homeland in Ur of the Chaldeans in Genesis chapter 12, and, but he doesn't tell Abraham where to go. He went out not knowing where to go. Hebrews 11 verse 8. Why didn't God tell Abraham where to go? Or at least describe to him the route, or at least tell him how long it would get there, uh, take to get there. Why didn't he do that? Very simply because God wanted Abraham to live, and in this case, literally to walk in complete dependence on him, in constant dependence on the Lord every step of the way. Abraham didn't need to know the way. Why? Because God knew the way. God knew the way, and he would direct Abraham. He would be Abraham's guide. Abraham had to just put one foot in front of the other and go forward, and God would direct his steps. As that verse says from Proverbs, in all your ways acknowledge the Lord, and he will guide your paths, right? Proverbs 3, verse 6. 
That's how Abraham lived. He lived by faith. I'm sure it was foolish to the people uh, of Ur when they saw Abraham leave and go out uh, not knowing where he was to go, just like it was foolishness and madness for the people of Assisi when they saw St. Francis begin to follow the Lord. Uh, but we know that the saints always do get the last laugh. They get the last laugh. After many trials and tears, they do get the last laugh. Why? Because they live by faith and God always rewards that. He always rewards when we walk by faith. Lastly, we'll just note in today's gospel that faith is the one thing that Jesus was looking for from his disciples in the midst of the storm at the sea. The disciples were afraid, and so they awoke the Lord, and Jesus rebuked the storm. And then uh, once the sea was calmed, Jesus turned and he rebuked his disciples, saying, Why were you afraid? Have you no faith? Have you no faith? Mark 4, verse 40. That type of complete faith in Jesus may be the one thing that he's looking for us, for, uh, he's looking at us, he wants to see that in us right now. Maybe that's the one thing he's looking for in the midst of the storms in our country and in our decadent culture and even in our own personal difficulties that we experience. Maybe the Lord is looking to see if we have faith. Do we honestly have faith in him? Or are we just constantly focusing on the storms? If we are storm-focused, we need to refocus and become Savior-focused instead. Start, turn, turn from focusing on the storms to focusing on the Savior. So let's not disappoint our Lord by not having faith in Him, by not trusting in Him. Let's have faith in Him. Let's trust in Him. Let's also reach out to Our Lady and take refuge in her in the midst of all the storms that rage around us and even in the midst of the storms and the darkness that sometimes rages and reigns within our own souls. Let's turn to Our Lady, take refuge in her. Jesus and Mary, both of them, will guide our paths if we trust in them. Praise be Jesus and Mary.